Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us today for a NASA, NASA Google Plus Hangout on sea level rise. Uh, we've gotten a number of questions from you already online, and uh, we'll be looking for more during today's Hangout. You can put them uh, in the comment section on the Google Plus Hangout event page or on Twitter using the hashtag sea level. Uh, my name is Patrick Lynch. I'm with NASA's Earth Science News Team, and I'll be helping get those questions to our experts today. Uh, today we want to talk about the basic dilemma of sea level rise, which is it has been rising over the last century or so, and that rise has been accelerating in recent decades. Uh, and the questions for scientists now are, how much is it going to rise? How fast will that rise occur? Uh, for NASA in particular, um, how can we measure and how can we predict that rise accurately? Um, and, and for us and others, who is this going to affect ultimately? Uh, we have a great panel today to talk about just these questions starting in Pasadena, California at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Josh Willis. He's the project scientist on NASA satellite missions that study sea level and as a scientist studies sea level rise uh, in the role of uh, the ocean and Earth's climate. Sophie Nowicki at Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland um, studies in particular the physics and modeling of ice sheets and glaciers um, and in the long term the contribution that ice sheets could make to sea level rise, not just in the coming decades, but even in the coming centuries. Uh, back in Pasadena at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, we have Michael Watkins. When he is not mission manager for the Mars Science Laboratory mission, uh, he is, uh, also works on NASA's Earth observing missions, including as project scientist for the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, which has given scientists uh, invaluable data in the last decade or so on uh, changes in ice sheets uh, in Greenland and Antarctica and other places. Uh, down in many Louisiana, we have Virginia Burkett. Uh, she is the chief scientist for global change research at the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, has been a lead author on multiple U.N. intergovernmental panel and climate change reports, uh, and studies in particular climate change impacts on uh, coastal communities and coastal ecosystems. And finally, in Garrison, New York, we have Andrew Revkin, a Senior Fellow for Environmental Understanding at Pace University and a Dot Earth blogger for the, for the New York Times. So looking forward to getting uh, your questions to uh, everyone today. And I'll just start us off, a uh, question for Josh. Um, just from a big picture perspective, can you give us kind of the, the current state of sea level rise research? What do we know about what's been happening in recent decades and, and what do we think um, is going to happen in the coming decades. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, and um, what a what a super fun way to uh, talk about a, a really interesting and really important topic. Um, I think, to me, uh, global sea level rise is um, one of the most uh, compelling pieces of of sort of information we have about um, how the planet is changing. Uh, in a lot of ways, sea level rise is both an indicator of climate change. Uh, remember, two-thirds of the planet is covered by oceans, and um, if we're looking for climate change, uh, really, we need to be looking in the oceans. But it's also an impact of climate change and global warming. Uh, millions of people around the world live in coastal areas, uh, and many more depend financially on those coastal areas and billions and billions of dollars of uh, infrastructure is um, in the coastal zone. And as uh, sea level rises over the next um, 100 years, uh, we're gonna have to make some tough decisions about um, just how to uh, deal with that rise um, and how to manage it. Uh, but the big question today, I think, is just how quickly are sea levels going to rise? Um, in the last uh, 20 years, we've had about six centimeters of sea level rise. That's a few inches. It's, uh, about a, it's a couple inches, about an inch per decade, a little faster than that. Um, and, uh, you know, looking out into the next 100 years, the question is, are we going to get another foot of sea level rise, or are we going to get another five or six feet of sea level rise? And as of right now, uh, we don't have a good answer to that question. Um, 
we uh, we have really have big uncertainties in terms of um, uh, just how much sea level we're going to be facing, sea level rise we're going to be facing. So um, it's an interesting time, uh, but it's also uh, you know it's a it's a concern as well. Right, uh, Andy. Just to to keep it going here, as someone that's written about this a lot, uh, if you have a group of people here that could answer a lot of questions. As a, as a journalist, what would, what's your sort of most pressing question on sea level rise to put out there? Well, I guess um, one of the key things, is, as Josh just pointed out, is that the unknowns that I wrote about in 1988 are the unknowns that we're still uh, looking at right now. Uh, that's kind of, uh, as an outside observer, uh, you know, you think, well, we're, doesn't science advance? But I guess, and science has advanced. Maybe you could describe how many more tools we have now than we had in 1988. Uh, but then, given that, say that it's still a hard problem. I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, I think uh, you know we're still faced with some some really big challenges in terms of how the ice sheets are going to respond. Um, you know, today we have a lot better tools just for measuring global sea level. We have uh, satellite observations uh, that measure sea level everywhere in the world once every 10 days uh, very accurately. And we can actually see uh, the march of global sea level rise as it happens. Um, but what we still have trouble with um, and what, what we're going to continue to have trouble with is predicting how the great ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica are going to respond to both the warming atmosphere and to the warming water. Um, recent research suggests that in fact uh, the ice sheets aren't just responding to the warming atmosphere, they're responding to changes in the oceans as well. And uh, these ocean ice interactions um, are really the crux of the matter in terms of trying to predict what's going to happen in the future. Um, there's a whole lot of uncertainty in uh, in how these things are going to respond, and you, know, you bring up a good point. We've been we've been kind of hacking away at this problem for a long time, uh, and there have been advances, but uh, the ice sheets are are still poorly explored, poorly understood, and and in some ways poorly measured. There there are some things about them that we measure well, but um, the sort of details and the kinds of physics that are going to determine how fast sea level rises over the next century, uh, we're still puzzling over those. And uh, a lot of people are working really hard, but it's going to take some more time. Another thing that's related to that is um, how to describe that uncertainty. Um, that, and when you talk about a range that could be from essentially a yawn, you know, another seven inches in 100 years or 15 inches, which is a little more than what we've seen so far. Um, to like five feet in 100 years, the difference is really big in terms of how societies would want to react. Um, and when you, t when you look carefully at what scientists say, like Stefan Ramsdorf uh, in Germany, who's been quite aggressive about you know, worrying about global warming, at the same time, he said the high end of that range is implicitly extremely unlikely. That's how he put it in um, a science perspective a couple of years ago that I wrote about on Dot Earth. I just posted a link to it. So, so, but scientists are very reluctant to sort of rule something out. So society is stuck with this, like, you know, how, how quickly do we move away from shorelines? How quickly do we start, start buying up coastal property uh, to get people out of ridiculously vulnerable zones? We're stuck kind of with this inability to have um, that conversation play out in a way that's, that sort of our conventional norms in society can get. I don't know if you've seen any, any way to get progress on that. It seems well, so, like this, the high end seems durably uncertain. Yeah, so Andrew, or I, I can take a little crack at that and then, you know, then, uh, then hand it off to Sophie maybe. Sure. Um, you know, we spent a, a lot of time trying to just understand what is currently happening, right? I mean, the first step toward predicting something is, is understanding it, it, measuring it. And so we've, you know, in the last, I would say, 10 years or 20 years, you know, since, since you know, you first started writing about this, I think we've made great strides, as Josh indicated, in measuring what's happening today. And in particular, measuring the ice sheets, we've made a lot of progress. We had a mission, uh, ISAT, that, uh, that, that made some uh, um, height measurements of, of, the, of the ice sheets. And we had this very cool mission called GRACE that you know, kind of weighed the ice sheet month to month. And we were able to see how these changes were happening in West Antarctica and, and in, in Greenland. 
But the real problem is there's a thousand variables that go into why the ice sheet is actually melting. Right? It could be that there's warm water coming up into these fjords. It could be that there's more sun uh, you know, melting from the, uh, from the top of the, of, of the ice sheets. And so understanding the physics, taking these measurements, and then trying to map that into the physics is really the problem that, that scientists are wrestling with now. So I think, the, I think we formed the basis to answer that question by taking all of these great measurements. But we still have a big challenge ahead in trying to sort out all the physics that's going on and what the biggest drivers in, in, um, in polar ice melt really is. And that, you know, we continue to make these measurements, we need to make more measurements. But I would say that the big progress in the last 20 years hasn't been on prediction, it's really been on measuring. And so I think we're now poised to take that next, next step, but, it, but it's a really complicated step. And one, one of the things I like to joke about is, uh, you know, we're in the middle of the Final Four here on, you know, in the NCAA tournament. Uh, you know, we know exactly what teams have won up to this point, but that doesn't really help us say who's going to win the next game, right? Because the, 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 you know, the understanding what makes a team win beat another team, right, that's, you know, is the defense better, the offense, who's sick that day, you know, what, who has home field advantage, all of these kind of things, you know, get into this very complicated equation. When we talk about climate change, we're talking about millions of variables that have to get sorted out. So it, 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 really, is a, it really is a tough problem, and, that, and that's really the big challenge facing us today. And just a, one more thing uh, before other questions start to come, on, come in. I've, I'm trying to share my screen. I'm not sure if you can see, but um, a NASA illustration that Josh is familiar with, uh, it relates to this question of acceleration. And on my blog, anytime I post on sea level rise, this debate erupts about uh, someone will just say in a sort of presumptive way, sea level rise is accelerating. And then every, everyone will point to graphs like this one and say, well, show me the acceleration. So if you guys could discuss that a little bit, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, the simple answer there is that that, that time series isn't long enough to see it. Um, so it's, it's still small enough that, um, you know, that uh, 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 over 20 years, um, you can't really see an acceleration. Oh, nice little uh, uh, graphic there. Um, actually, there's another graphic uh, we could show. Um, there's the one of the 2,000 years of sea level rise. I'm not sure if the NASA Goddard folks have that one. Um, or uh, not that one, but the one in the backup material. Um, Two thousand years of sea level rise. See if they can find it. Yeah. Um, but but the uh, uh, the short answer is that the acceleration has happened really over uh, the rates that we've seen for the last couple of thousand years. Um, in the last two thousand years, sea level has been fairly uh, fairly stable. Uh, there have been a few periods with um, rates of rise um, that are small but not insignificant. Uh, and then if you, you know, if you look at the last 150 years, then clearly there's been an, uh, uh, an increase in the rate of sea level rise uh, that's quite dramatic uh, relative to anything that's happened in the last couple thousand years. So it's in that sense that over the last 100 or 150 years, we've uh, certainly seen an increase in the rate of sea level rise. Um, if sea level had been rising for uh, three millimeters per year for the last 2,000 years, then you know, we would have had uh, much higher uh, rates of, of rise. Yeah. It, it, within that, is there any way to discriminate um how much of that was a kind of rebound from the uh, Little Ice Age versus, um, you know, yeah, something? Yeah, let's see. I tell you what, I'll just, um, I'll just try and share this, uh, this slide. Let's see if this works. Um, yeah, here you can see uh, that basically for the last 2,000 years, um, this is a, a a sea level record from North Carolina um, taken in the salt marshes there that uh, uh, illustrates essentially what I'm talking about that um, uh, essentially we had no sea level rise uh, for the first millennium of this record uh, dating back about 2,000 years. Um, and then uh, during what's called the medieval warm period there was a period of, uh, of more rapid rise. Uh, sea level rose about 20 centimeters in, in several hundred years. And then it was stable again, and um, the the period called the Little Ice Age uh, saw perhaps a small decline in sea level, a small uh, downturn, uh, but really no significant change in the rate of, 
of sea level. Uh, and then at the very end of the record, you can see the upturn, which agrees with modern day tide gauges and is about two millimeters per year um, over most of the last 100. Uh, so this is what we, uh, you know, what um, it's sort of the first uh, effort to, to make what you might call a, a hockey stick for sea level. Um, controversial term, but uh, uh, nevertheless, this is essentially what we're looking at is a record that's been fairly stable for about 2,000 years and uh, well, rising really rapidly at the end. Yeah, and Josh, actually, sea level has been relatively stable for even longer than that. The past six to 7,000 years, that's when coast globally emerged as we know them today. And as sea level rise accelerates, we'll see another series of transgression where, um, like we had in the earlier part of this interglacial. So during the past 7,000 years, that's where U.S. coastlines, that's the time period in which coastlines as we know them today, all of the Mississippi Delta, for example, all of southeast Louisiana, half of that state, you know, basically formed during that 7,000 years of relatively small changes in mean sea level. Great. Are there any okay. questions that have come in from the outside world yet? Uh, we, d we do have a number. Uh, we can get to those in a second. I want to follow up on, um, on what Virginia was saying there, uh, and, and that is it, it has been stable, but what we know sea level has changed in the past, and I think a lot of people say uh, when you look at these things over the very long term, well, it's changed before. Um, you know, wh what is different this time? And I, I think obviously the answer is there's a lot more people and infrastructure on the coast. Right. But but how do you answer that very basic question of, you know, well, why does it matter what's different this time in terms of looking to the future and planning for it? Well, one thing that's different in America, one half, roughly, of our population lives in coastal watershed counties and the infrastructure that's present in the coast, the societal vulnerability is, uh, that's, that's where it is uh, for the United States. More than half of our GDP, uh, some studies indicate, comes from these coastal watershed counties. So the risk, the exposure for uh, society is much greater than it has been in, in past epochs of sea level change. What's also different is the cause. Um, in the past, uh, mm. the cycle of the ice ages was really driven by uh, changes in the amount of uh, energy we got from the sun that had to do with small shifts in the orbit and, and uh, uh, sort of angle that the Earth stood at relative to the sun. Um, what's causing it today is uh, human emitted greenhouse gases and the warming um, that's uh, really driven by human caused activity. Right. And if you look at this graphic, I believe that folks can see now, the it's the relative change in mean sea level that determines whether a coast will be inundated or not. If you look at this graphic here, you'll see parts of the U.S. coast, the change in sea level looks higher. And that's because the tide gauges there and the land surface are actually sinking with respect to mean sea level. And so you can see in this graphic a you know, a much higher rate of, of, of relative sea level rise, an increase up to uh, six to eight inches in the central Gulf Coast, for example. So all places are not equally vulnerable. In some parts of the country, like off the Canadian coast there and off uh, the Bering Straits, you can see uh, that sea level appears to be falling, and that's because of the glacial rebound there of the land surface. And so uh, the, the threat to communities and uh, coastal ecosystems in some parts of the country are, are much less than along that, particularly that Atlantic and Gulf Coast uh, shorelines. One of the weirdest examples like that, I think, is around Juneau, from what I understand, where mm -hmm. people are trying to figure out what to do with all this new property. That, you know, who does it belong to? <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. But on the North Slope, we've got not just sea level rise right. affecting the coastal communities there, but the temperature, another major driver associated with, uh, with the, the ch changing climate here, the temperature change is causing the coastal landscape to collapse because the sediments are bound with ice. And so a lot of the coastal landscape there 
is more vulnerable to uh, this temperature effect than it is to changes in mean sea level, coupled with the ice sheet retreat, which is increasing coastal erosion, and they're having to, to move communities off the coastline of the northern Alaska. Virginia, I wonder if we could follow up on that. Um, and we're going to look at a question we, we got from online. But if you could name sort of, uh, let's say, three places in in the U.S. that have a sort of a particular uh, vulnerability to sea level rise, and then, you know, beyond here, we got a question from uh, Rana Usman on Google Plus asking uh, what effect sea level will have on, on South Asian countries. Oh. Uh, on the South Asian part, uh, in our last IPCC report, we highlighted highlighted mega deltas as hot spots of societal vulnerability. And if you look at that report, we've got these maps showing that the Asian mega deltas are, you know, where you've got these intense populations living on the edge, literally, in these low-lying deltaic systems that were formed when sea level rise, when their sea level was relatively stable, and the moment that sea level rise starts to accelerate, those landforms start to be transgressed by the shoreline, and the flooding is exacerbated. And then, and then you couple that with the propensity for more intense storms. So in Asia, I'd say if you had to pick out a hot spot societally, it's the mega deltas, the large deltas in uh, China and India and elsewhere. Uh, the the in Vietnam and Cambodia particularly where you've got a, a low capacity for moving people out of these these low lying areas other hot spots in America I've mentioned Alaska in our coastal uh, report that we just produced for the National Climate Assessment 79 co-authors on that report we have several uh, text boxes dealing with climate change in Alaska and so the Alaskan coastline, for reasons I've already explained, are particularly vulnerable. And if you look at this map here, you can see other places that are vulnerable. Um, in Louisiana and Texas, for example, where the land surface is sinking up to one centimeter per year. And then if you put you know, another half a centimeter per year or more on top of that, when you've got these environments that are no more than one to two feet above mean sea level, uh, those environments are very likely to be inundated and lost. And again, couple that with changes in storm surge intensity, and uh, the, which is also projected to increase for this particular ocean basin, where hurricanes form that make landfall in the Atlantic coast of America and along the Gulf Coast. Then uh, those two drivers in in uh, Louisiana, we lost 217 square miles of coast overnight in Hurricane Katrina. So it's not just sea level rise that is affecting these low-lying coasts, it's these other drivers as well, like the temperature in Alaska and the changes in the uh, these storm surge, the intensity or destructiveness of storms. Right. You know, Patrick, we uh, talked a little bit about um, uncertainty and future rates of sea level rise earlier, and uh, I think one of the big places where that uh, that uncertainty resides is in how the ice sheets uh, are, are, are behaving and so maybe we could get uh, Sophie to tell us a little bit about um, about that and uh, and what, what's being understood and, and what the future of that sort of uh, research entails. Yeah I think I wanted to answer back about your questions about uncertainty and why is it so hard to predict future sea level um, the reason, to some extent, that it might seem like there hasn't been much progress compared to what you wrote many years ago, um, is that the, we do have made actually quite a lot of progress. Like we understand a bit better how uh, ice sheet flow and what makes a good ice sheet model. Uh, but the problem is the more, and that's due because of all of the observations that we've made in the recent years. The tricky bit is that the more we observe uh, ice sheets, the more we realize that there's phenomena that we don't know, uh, that we didn't know that existed. So on the caption that's, on the little movie that's being flowing, like you have a moonland that's being draining, so it's like water forming at the surface of the ice sheet that's kind of draining into the base um, and cruising speed up. And that's a new process we had no idea existed. We still don't understand how to model it, 
and then uh, what causes it. And then once we actually understand how it behaves, we would have to find a way to include it into the model. So we have made a lot of progress. We've discovered new phenomena that we know we need to incorporate in our sheet models. But at the same time, um, we, the more we understand, the less we understand. Um, the other reason it's very hard to make a future predictions is that you really need to understand what the future is going to be. Uh, what are going to be your forcing? Is the oceans going to become warmer? Is the atmosphere going to become warmer? What are the dominant factors? So that's why projections range by a lot. Um, you, you mentioned that some people believe that there is projection that in 100 years' time we would have only a few centimeters um, of future sea level. And there is also uh, much, mean, much more bigger numbers, such like meters of sea level rise. And that's really the, the problem is, is that you, you have an uncertainty in the ice sheet models. You have some uncertainty into the future projection, what's going to be the future. And then you also have some uncertainty about the current settings of the ice sheet. So for example, what is the bed beneath the ice sheets look like? Because uh, that's going to control um, how your ice sheet is going to respond. Um, can warm water from the ocean reach uh, the base of the ice, whereas you know it's going to um, to have huge effect. So for this, for example, for the bed, NASA is um, doing a lot of measurements of bedrocks underneath the ice sheet with Operation Ice Bridge. And uh, there's very recent observations that ice sheet models didn't have uh, until now. And if you ask me, the data is uh, getting there and it's becoming amazing. But we still need a lot uh, to understand the current environment and the current settings in order to predict future changes. So yeah, you know, one, quick. one thing I might add on to that, by the way, is that you know I think some people might think, you know, the ice sheets are kind of just stable, and then we're melting a little bit off, you know, but otherwise they're just stable. In fact, what really happens is, you know, it's snowing a lot, and the ice sheets are growing during the winter, and then they're melting off in the summer, and then growing in the winter and melting off again. This is true in Antarctica uh, and Greenland both, and so it's actually kind of the balance between those two. And if, and, as Sophie was saying, if 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 the atmosphere changes and you get a lot more precipitation. Then, then the amount of, of net ice loss is a lot less. So, it, in fact, it's not just what's happening right on the ice sheet. It's also, you know, how does the whole climate, how is precipitation, uh, how is the ocean temperature? There's lots of factors that have to be solved for in uh, in understanding the future, um, the, you know, future future of these ice sheets. And uh, you know, we talked about just a couple of those variables, like what you know, what's the topography under the ice sheet, as what Sophie was talking about. But this whole question of what is the atmosphere doing and what is the ocean doing. Are, are inseparably coupled to the future of the ice sheet. So we have to project not just the future of the ice sheet, but the future of the atmosphere and the future of the ocean. And that's a, it's a big challenge. What, what are the, um, and, and Sophie, you listed a bunch of them right there, but, but if you were to name sort of the, the biggest obstacle to, to being able to make uh, a solid projection about the contribution of, of ice sheets to sea level rise, what what would it be? Um, in, in my mind, the there is the biggest obstacle is not knowing really the topography beneath the ice sheets, because um, it, it affects how much ice there is available to melt. Uh, so if you're making a cake, you know it kind of affects how big your cake is going to be, um, and also um, the the way the bedrock is. Um, if you, it's going to affect how the ice is going to uh, flow. So, for example, if you are um, s um, skiing down a very nice uh, groove ice surface, it's very easy for you to kind of uh, slide down your slope. But then, um, if you and if your bedrock is very nice and smooth, it's very easy for you to flow in the sediments, and so you're going to be reacting very, very strongly to any type of uh, future changes. But then if you are, for example, skiing over snow that's not really good quality and you have, um, for example, lots of patches of um, earth and, you know, grass sticking out, <laughs> you are going to, it's going to be much harder for you to slide and to behave and to move. So really, um, what, for me, what's happening beneath the ice sheet, what the bedrock looks like, what type of um, geology it is, um, is going to always be one of the factors that contributes, I mean, that dominates your response. Uh, so the bed is 
in my mind, the biggest uncertainty. Because again, uh, the, as I mentioned a bit before, the bed, the shape of the bed is going to um, also affect how uh, the warm water from the ocean, the warming oceans, are going to be able to reach or not reach the ice sheets. So uh, it's really the the conditions of things that you cannot see. Um, I have a follow-up question related to that. So are there um, any remote sensing methods that can get, get people down there? I did write a couple of years ago about some cool work by actually a NASA scientist who dropped a, dropped a camera down a Mulan to try to get a picture of the um, underbelly of a, an ice sheet. Uh, but it was very pre preliminary, obviously very limited in scope. Uh, so what else can be done to uh, clarify what that interface between the ice and the rock is like? Um, so I'll, I'll take that one again, and then maybe afterwards, um, George uh, and Mike can uh, uh, contribute to that too. But um, so at the moment, NASA has this huge campaign called the Operation Ice Bridge. Um, it's basically aircraft that are flying um, over Greenland and Antarctica. Um, they have radar, uh, and the radar gives them the returns from the radar gives them um, an, an idea about uh, how thick the ice sheet is. Um, you can also try to uh, measure from space um, what the ge what the, the geothermal heat flux beneath the ice sheet is, uh, and NASA again is um, doing a lot of work on that. Um, and as you said, there is also uh, a lot of groundwork uh, with people dropping uh, things in moulins, people drilling. Uh, ice calls and uh, trying to get sensors down the ice sheets and reaching the best. So uh, you're right, there is a lot of different type of measurements uh, being used and uh, giving us a clearer picture every day of um, what is happening down there. Someone I remember joking about putting uh, the rubber duckies down <laughs> Mulans to see where they come out. You know, those little floating yellow ducks. Oh, it, it did happen, actually. Oh, they did that? Um, yes, yes, yes. Uh, they did. Uh, so, I mean, uh, we did have some uh, field work uh, with the uh, yellow ducks being put down Mulan, and also we are putting dye, uh, I mean, colored water uh, down yeah. the Mulan. Um, so we can be quite, science can be fun, we can be very creative that way. Um, the problem is that sometimes it doesn't come out. I mean, the ducks don't always come out and they get sure. stuck, or they come out many years later when you know that to observe. But right. uh, the more creative you are, um, I guess, the better. Cool. It, it, is, it is a hard measurement to make. I mean, most of the measurements we make from space are of the surface of the Earth, right, or the surface of the ocean. And it actually is quite challenging for us to make observations of the, you know, the bedrock below the ice. Uh, you know, we were successful a little bit in kind of weighing the ice with this GRACE mission, but a lot of what we know about the deep ocean and below the ice sheets, it has to come from basically measurements made maybe from an airplane, like an ice sounder trying to, you know, trying to bounce uh, uh, radar waves off, off the ground and ice interface, uh, or actually just going out in the field, field and drilling and, and, uh, and doing the best you can sort of in situ measurements. And uh, this is true in the ocean, too. A lot of what we know about the deep ocean comes from you know, sensors that we've deployed from ships and, uh, and, and are actually, you know, in the ocean, in the deep ocean. So it's actually the hardest things for us to measure from space. As good as we are, you know, at NASA with making these measurements is stuff that's below the surface. You know, as soon as you get a meter below the surface, it's, uh, it's tough to see it from space. Yeah, let me uh, go ahead and jump in. We've got a number of questions that have been sent in from, from online. Uh, uh, these are on different topics, so maybe we can just kind of go through them, um, through them one off here. Um, so uh, Mario Rivera says the word "dramatic" is being used here, um, but will this be comparable with the, I guess, the changes with the around the Little Ice Age? Uh, yeah, well, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, this is Josh. Uh, we talked about that just a little bit earlier, actually. Um, they're already much bigger, the changes, uh, than what occurred during the Little Ice Age, especially in terms of sea level uh, rise. Um, we have this uh, really amazing record from North Carolina that shows uh, uh, well, really very little change in, in sea level there uh, during what's referred to as the Little Ice Age. 
Um, and then the, the dramatic uh, roughly two millimeters per year uh, uh, rise that we've seen over most of the last 100 years. So um, we've already really outpaced anything that's happened uh, during the Little Ice Age and are, are off into new territory here. Okay. Uh, I'll throw out another one here that just says, um, Josh, you showed the 2,000-year sea level rise record in North Carolina. It says, how was that data collected? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. It's actually kind of a neat story. Um, it turns out that the coast there, uh, as Virginia mentioned earlier, is sinking slightly. Uh, and this is due to um, the end of the last ice age. Uh, about 20,000 years ago, there were big um, ice sheets over a lot of North America, and these compressed the land there. And um, as those melted and disappeared, uh, then the land under the ice sheets uplifted, and the land uh, further away started to sink. And the coastline where these was, were collected is in one of those regions that's slowly sinking uh, over the past many thousand years this has been going on. And it turns out that that particular coastline uh, contains salt marshes. And in these marshes, there are small uh, critters that live in a very narrow band of the, uh, the tidal zone. Um, in addition, particularly on that coast, uh, the tidal range is very small. Um, and all this allows researchers to go back and uh, drill cores down through the sediments uh, created in this salt marsh and essentially uh, make a record back in time over exactly how relative sea level has changed. Uh, now we can compute and, and measure the sort of ongoing um, uh, sinking rate and uh, extrapolating that back over time, uh, you can essentially get the record that I showed uh, almost, uh, uh, you know, really one of the most accurate in both um, vertical dimension as well as, uh, as well as in time uh, records of sea level rise anywhere in the last, uh, any, anywhere in the world. Uh, so it's really kind of an amazing detective story uh, and uh, researchers are doing a lot of interesting work to reconstruct uh, how sea level has changed um, in, in the last uh, several thousand years. And this is one of those really cool, really cool uh, success stories there. Well, and to follow up with that on the, on the detective work, uh, Tom Notes asks, what about post-glacial rebound, which we've talked about a bit, but maybe to, to put a finer point on that question is, how do you uh, determine how much rise is occurring due to post-glacial rebound and how much is, is occurring due to either thermal expansion or, or you know, ice sheets melting. I guess how do you sort of divide the, yeah. you know. I, I, I don't mean to uh, sort of um, uh, take over the, the throne here for so long answering all these questions, but uh, in that particular case, essentially the, the rate of, of, uh, of sinking has been uh, very accurately calculated and, and is stable over the course of several thousand years. So uh, this is a place without a lot of uh, tectonic activity where you have um, big changes that happen all of a sudden. Really, this is a, a reaction to that ice that, that disappeared um, 20,000 years ago. And so they can compute fairly accurately uh, the rate of um, the rate of uh, sinking, and you can measure it in present day as well. Um, so it's a combination of all those things that gives us this sort of uh, this sort of model of how post glacial rebound uh, is affecting the, the local sea level, and, and that can be removed uh, fairly accurately. Okay, uh, we're still still getting a bunch here, so let me throw this out. And I think this is sort of the uh, the question to end all questions on sea level rise, but it is. Uh, uh, let me just scroll away here. Uh, how, how much rise becomes significant enough to provoke a response, and how do we plan accordingly for the medium uh, to long term? Uh, Virginia, why don't we throw that to you first, since you've looked mostly at, at mitigation and, and adaptation. I think you're on mute. Coastal systems uh, often are noted to have a threshold at which a response is very evident to us. 
you know, just a gradual increase in sea level may occur and have very minor impacts on the rate of erosion or retreat of a shoreline until a storm comes along. And then we see these dramatic changes. I think we have a graphic showing uh, Dolphin Island off of the Alabama coast. Uh, you know, this, it's a real good example of how a threshold has been breached here. Uh, the Chandler Island chain, I can think of many uh, places where the response of a coastal system may go along very slow and then all of a sudden you may have uh, the salinity change to a point where the forest will die off. We've seen that off of uh, off the Florida coast for example. Uh, so there are thresholds in systems and that's why it's you can't just project you know US wide or even globally exactly how much land will be lost at a certain rate of sea level rise because each system has its own internal responses depending upon the rate of uh, uplift or subsidence, their salinity tolerance of the plants that bind the soil. You know, a lot of variables influence that coastal response. But the question that we have kind of points to this fact that there are thresholds in systems. And we have uh, some evidence that thresholds have been crossed in some U.S. coastal systems in terms of their ability to keep pace with sea level rise. Marshes accumulate material vertically, but it comes to a point where they can't keep pace if sea level rise accelerates and they ultimately they, they can be drowned in place rather than either accreting vertically or migrating inland. One thing, one thing I would add to what Virginia is saying, uh, Virginia actually mentioned it earlier, and that is that, that the interaction of sea level rise with storms is, is also something to, to really keep in mind, particularly in these low-lying areas, you know, like uh, you know, in New Orleans right. and the Gulf Coast. It's not just the sea level rise inundating, it's sea level rise coupled with storms or more frequent storms causing, causing the sum of those two things to, uh, to inundate uh, much more areas. And of course, you know, the kind of things we saw with Katrina or with, with other, uh, uh, other storm activities you know, could certainly get a lot worse. And so, so those, it's not just straight sea level you know, coming up like a bathtub filling, it's, it's that plus storm surge. Right. Let me, let me uh, thanks for throwing that in, Michael, because that actually answered a number of questions that had come in. People are asking about the link between uh, uh, how sea level rise will affect other weather phenomenon. Uh, we have two questions here that, that kind of go together, uh, so I'll throw these out. One is from Bruce Karen. one is from, I think, a congressional committee. Um, it says, are there new NASA data resources that are planned to help study sea level changes in the next 10 years? Uh, and Similarly, what further research investments are necessary to better understand the relationship between sea level rise and extreme weather? Um, Michael, as the as the engineer, maybe looking. <laughs> sure. So, um, so we have uh, we have two satellites that have measured the ice sheets a lot, by the way, and that's uh, the ISAT and Grace, and uh, we actually have replacements for both of those missions in work by NASA. So we have a uh, an ISAT two coming that uh, should make very detailed measurements of the elevation of the ice sheets uh, over Greenland and Antarctica to help us understand the kind of questions that Sophie was talking about. We also have a GRACE, uh, basically a GRACE 2, a GRACE follow-on mission that's going to continue doing this weighing of the ice sheets um, every month so that, that uh, again, we can try to understand the glacial contributions to, uh, to sea level rise and, and to try to get a better understanding what physical climate process is causing that, um, that ice melt. We also continue our series of observations of the ocean surface. Uh, we have a, uh, a joint series of missions that have been going for about 20 years with, uh, with, with the French Space Agency. Uh, we call those the JSON uh, satellites and they measure the sea surface height very accurately. And uh, the sea surface height is a combination of how much water is in the ocean as well as how much it's thermally expanding. And by comparing those measurements with, with race measurements and with some in situ measurements uh, of, the, of the temperature and, and, and uh, salinity in the ocean, we can get a much better idea of what's what, what's driving sea level rise, uh, you know, from the oceanographic perspective as well. And so we continue these kind of measurements, um, you know, for the next decade or so, and we think it will help. In addition to all of the airborne and in situ, you know, field campaigns that uh, you know that folks are doing to try to to, to, to try try to get a handle on this. Um, and you know, when it, when I talk about sea level rise here, you know, as Josh said in the very beginning of this, sea level rise is an indicator. Of, of what's going on in, in on the earth, right? It's not it's not the cause, it's the result of things that are going on. So in fact we also continue all of the weather observations and atmospheric observations as well to try to understand, you know, are precipitation patterns changing, 
uh, you know, is atmospheric temperature changing and how do those interact with, um, you know, with, with the kind of factors, particularly in the ice sheets that are, that are driving sea level, uh, sea level rise. So yeah, um, if I can, oh, sorry, go ahead. Andy. Uh, well, actually this question is for all of you, but Michael, particularly uh, looking at these uh, planned projects, how many of them are secure in terms of our budget, given what's going on with um, discussions I, in Washington? I think the ones I mentioned are pretty secure. Um, they're well into development. So, um, you know, the, the, the Jason missions, the Grace uh, follow-on and the ISAT-2 are, are deep into development. And I think those are, uh, you know, very, very high probability that those, that those will continue. And in fact, the support for earth science is actually quite strong now. And so there's a, a pretty robust uh, observation program to help us, you know, sort out what's, what's really going on. And I think those missions are pretty, uh, pretty safe. Josh, did you have a comment you were going to make there? Well, yeah, and just to tack on to that, that um, you know, uh, I think the, um, you know, missions being safe is, uh, um, is sort of a relative term. We, we continue to struggle with uh, budget issues, uh, even on the Jason missions, where uh, they've continued to cause delays in the launch. And uh, I think that, um, you know, a as an agency, uh, NASA and, and its partners are uh, in some ways actually struggling to figure out how to make uh, ongoing repetitive missions happen uh, and um, tie together these uh, long records of, uh, of, of measurements from space. Um, it's, a, it's an engineering challenge, but it's, it's more than that. I think it's really a, a challenge to our um, our uh, our persistence and, and a challenge to our, our will to keep these uh, these missions flying um, and to make them continuous from one mission to the next. Uh, so while you know a, a lot of as Mike says uh, you know a lot of the things on the horizon um, have a positive outlook. Uh, you know we're not we're not uh, ringing alarm bells. Um, there are still challenges both. Uh, both scientific, well, scientific engineering and budgetary. Um, so we have to continue to be vigilant here and, and uh, 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 you know, press that these things uh, carry on. Um, making, making continuous measurements isn't easy and uh, it, it requires a, a certain will to do so. And we're still, we're still trying to figure out how to demonstrate that we actually have that will. Just a real quick follow-up to that, um, Michael, you talked about budget being secure and you feel okay with that, but what about the timeline getting to Josh's point about continuity of measurements? Um, it, it, yeah, that's, does the timeline seem, seem okay? Or? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I think, you know, we started this off talking, you know, in response to your original question, which is, you know, how, how much do you have to measure in order to, until you understand? And uh, I think we've had a hard time saying, you know, one mission's enough, five years is enough, or ten years is enough. It may turn out because of the complexity of the system that we need, you know, a long series of missions. And I think Josh's point is we're, you know, we're, we're we have to learn how to do that, you know, as a, uh, you know, as a, as a society. You know, how are we going to invest in uh, long-term observations, in, you know, until we understand it, and how how well do you have to understand it in order to answer pressing societal questions? You know, what when our coastlines in jeopardy or or, or other ecosystems. And, uh, and actually, you know, in fact, Sophie was talking about this too. We, we actually don't quite know the answer to this yet. So we are still learning how much observation we need to answer the, the most pressing questions. And in that sense, it's not easy to say, one, you know, just fund one more mission and that's enough. And so we're, you know, I think as a science community and an engineering community are working together to try to get a, a better answer to that question so that it's not an infinite amount of money forever, but, uh, but it's not one more mission either. I think I wanted to um, I, I wanted to add to this point, Michael. That it, you're very right um, of uh, the difficulty when you have a, a budget that's um, defined is that you have to find the right balance between how much you are willing to continue observing the way you are and the current missions, and as I did for many many years, and how much you want to develop new missions that are going to tell you something new. And it's a very tough balance because the, um, the long-term trends, for example, that uh, gives you information on how the surface temperature have changed over the ice sheet since the 70s are extremely important in order to understand what's happening and for the modeling to test the models. So you need to continue um, them. Um, and then at the same 
time, as I mentioned, I think before, it's true that for me the biggest unknown is what's happening beneath the bed, and so I would love I would love NASA to invest into uh, missions that will tell you more about uh, conditions underneath the ice sheets, um, and it's a it must be it's a very hard trade off uh, to know really. Do you need to have something new, or do you continue the long time? And it's, I think uh, the right way is to do both, because for the modeling part of you, you need to understand the new, um, new observations, but you also need to make sure you have the very long-term trends. OK. Let's uh, jump back. We have a number of uh, great questions coming in here. Um, Tony Himmel asks, is there any evidence showing that the North Atlantic conveyor belt is being affected by the melting of the Greenland ice sheet? That's a good question. Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, there is no evidence that the uh, overturning circulation, uh, which is popularly, popularly referred to as the conveyor belt, uh, is, is slowing down in response to Greenland melting. Um, it's been predicted that it will slow down over the next 100 years, uh, but mostly not due to, to ice loss due to changes in uh, just the surface temperature of the oceans and, and the amount of rainfall and evaporation and so forth. Uh, but uh, this is a good point um, that we expect not just uh, sea levels to change, but also um, ocean sort of climate conditions to change uh, in the coming uh, decades and century, uh, and these will have implications on on rainfall, on regional climate, and so forth, um, and and may eventually have some uh, feedbacks in terms of global climate. Uh, but we really don't yet see any major change uh, in the ocean's conveyor belt or the the overturning circulation. Okay, um, there's another good one from Paul Magnus uh, who asks, "What about risk?" How do we apply the risk of a two meter potential two meter rise compared to a five centimeter rise? Uh, he says, I don't think people are adequately taking into account risk here. Um, Virginia, again, is that one that you want to take up? Sure. Um, I, a very good question and a very good point. You know, as has been explained very well here, we don't know exactly the rate of future sea level rise, and so what most scientists have agreed to is kind of a range of plausible changes in mean sea level through this century. And uh, so what I would advise, and I work a lot with coastal states and communities, is considering a range of sea level rise. The question for Mr. Magnus is two centimeters versus five centimeters. Well, I would consider that range... Five, five meters, I think. Two centimeters versus five meters was his question. Oh, two meters versus five centimeters. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, um, right. Okay. And the, the rate of, you know, if we were to pick one number, we'd probably give you the wrong number. And so in our reports and our, in our assessments that we do internationally and for the United States, presenting this range of change that the scientists and the, the modeling results generally agree to in presenting you with that range. And how do you apply that? You know, why such a large range? Well, as Mr. Magnus points out, it depends on how much risk that the community or the industry is willing to, or needs to consider. If you're talking about locating a power plant, for example, in a coastal zone, you might want to consider that higher range is possible. It's in the literature, even though the, the mid-range may be one to four feet. You know, some of the literature suggests it might be higher. If you're just restoring the vegetation on a barrier island that doesn't cost a lot of money, that two meter range may not be important to you. So so, like he pointed out, considering the risk, uh, you know, using this range of scenarios is important. In Louisiana, for their, their master plan, and I said that 50% of the state was uh, coastal um, um, delta. It's not. It's 54% of the state is, is uh, geologic floodplain, but a lot of that geologic floodplain is in the coastal zone. And in their restoration plans, they consider two scenarios of sea level rise, a low range and a more aggressive range of sea level rise. And for every project they have for their coastal protection master plan, they analyzed cost and benefits under the low range and the high range. And then they made the decisions based upon that, both range, the entire range, not just um, the high or the low. Okay. Uh, we got a number of questions here, actually. 
wondering whether sea level rise will affect uh, the Great Lakes. Is there any indication that that, that would be the case? I think the short answer is no. No. Okay. <laughs> Different systems entirely. Uh, Although, yeah. can I can I kind of interject one thing that's is related? Sure. You, uh, a year or so ago, I think Josh was involved in work that uh, showed that one of the big short-term, I think you called it a pothole in sea level rise trend, was because a lot of water got piled up on the continents, um, which is kind of relevant in a way. You know, could you yeah, just kind of get at that that it isn't just thermal expansion and and uh, gl melting glaciers, but water, on short time scales, water can actually just sort of move on to the land if there's a lot of rain and that kind of thing. Could you talk about that? Yeah, it was, uh, it was really neat. It's kind of one of the, um, kind of one of the fun success stories of our, our satellite missions. Um, we can measure sea level rise with an accuracy of a few millimeters now um, over, a, over a few month period in, in terms of the global mean. And uh, between 2010 and 2011, there was about a, a five millimeter or half a centimeter drop in global sea level. And so uh, we puzzled about it for a while. We wondered, well, maybe the, the oceans cooled off um, and shrank a little bit. Uh, whenever water gets warm, it expands. When it gets cold, it shrinks. And uh, this is a contributor to sea level change. But it turned out that that wasn't the case. It turned out that, uh, in fact, water had been evaporated out of the ocean, uh, rained down over the continents, and it was stored there for a period of about six months or a year. And uh, the reason we the reason we know this, ah, thanks, Andy. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> the reason we know this is uh, really because of one of our other satellite missions uh, called Grace. Uh, and GRACE is a, a gravity mission that essentially weighs the continents from space. And you can see a, a, a big loss in mass uh, in um, Australia and in Brazil. And this, uh, or excuse me, a big gain in mass in Australia and Brazil and um, a few other places on the continents around the planet. And this gain uh, essentially equaled the amount of water uh, lost from the oceans. So GRACE actually allowed us to see uh, the water disappear from the oceans and then reappear uh, over the continents. Um, and it was in large part due to uh, a climate phenomenon called El Nino, uh, or really the El Nino-La Nina uh, oscillation. Um, in 2011 we had a big, or 2010 we had a big El Nino, uh, and in 2011 we had a big La Nina. And, these patterns in the Pacific uh, shift the jet stream around and, and change the regions that receive uh, most of the precipitation. And so in this case, it, it worked uh, in such a way that, that water was temporarily uh, uh, evaporated out of the ocean and stored on land. What was interesting was that um, because we knew where the water kind of went, uh, we had a good sense that um, it would run back into the ocean fairly quickly, and that's exactly what happened. Um, in 2012, uh, we had extremely rapid sea level rise, and uh, it essentially all, all the water that was sort of temporarily stored wound up running back into the oceans. Okay. Uh, we are we're getting up against an hour here, so maybe we'll do a couple quick questions. Sure. Uh, this one is... Uh, this one is a little offbeat, but I thought it was um, an interesting question. And Michael, this may be for you. Um, if I ask, if sea level is rising, um, what does that mean as far as where, say, the height of something like Mount Everest would be calculated from? Huh. So this is kind of a geek question. In other words, we're always saying everything is relative <laughs> to what's the height above sea level. At what point does that change, and at what point does that uh, change the, the definition of how tall Mount Everest is? Um, yeah, that, I mean that, that's kind of an interesting question. You know, it, it's just a matter of kind of of what we how we choose to to say it. Right now, we you know we we do give a height above kind of an average surface, kind of an average uh, mean sea level. That mean sea level is not not a real surface. It's kind of a fictitious uh, surface because there's waves and there's you know oceanography going on all the time. And so we we kind of have just chosen a reference surface for um, you know for how we measure heights. And uh, and you know if, if it changes significantly enough, we could choose to, uh, you know 50 years or 100 years from now, we could choose a, a different reference height. 
<laughs> um, and uh, there are international, believe it or not, there are international organizations that try to make all countries have the same reference heights and you know reference everything to the same kind of zero value and and uh, and those international organizations meet and they try to make sure that you know the heights in the U.S. and the heights in Germany are the you know are referenced to the same thing, and uh, and uh, and those groups will continue to meet and it, and if uh, if the sea level rise is significant, they could uh, they could choose a new a new reference value. Okay, uh, I've got one more question, and maybe I'll I'll throw it to to Andy for one final question to wrap us up here. But mine is, um, and I don't know if this is for for Sophie in Virginia, maybe, um, and you may not know the answer, but. Uh, Coming up soon will be the, the fifth IPCC report, which kind of gives everyone a, uh, a baseline um, to talk about in terms of a lot of climate change indicators and things that are going on. With sea level rise, the big thing last time was that it did not include contribution. The projections did not include a contribution from, from Antarctica and Greenland. Uh, can we expect that the upcoming report this time will include that, or, or do we know? Um, I'll say definitely yes, um, it will. Um, for two, I mean, because basically the fact that uh, the projections did not include dynamic ice sheets, um, the, everyone in the glaciology community, so all of the modelers um, and the field scientists uh, took that kind of badly. We kind of thought that we were not uh, contributing or doing a job well. Um, and so we really focused the last five years on trying to kind of improve yeah. our understanding. Uh, in particular, there has been a huge effort in uh, Europe, um, a project called ice to sea There was uh, a lot of scientists involved trying to tackle that question. Um, NASA had its own uh, little effort called the uh, Sea Rise, which I helped uh, um, co-lead, and uh, where basically we took uh, all the existing ice sheet models um, that uh, we had and tried to understand the future dynamics. So the, what we're finding is that um, it's actually quite tricky to include the dynamical response because of factors that um, I had mentioned at the beginning such like you don't really know the settings or the bad effects we're finding that it's becoming quite important you don't really know what your future forcings are going to be um, but uh, you definitely will read in the IPCC um, some of the improvements that uh, we have made uh, over the last few years okay great well uh, Andy why don't I Oops. throw it to you do you have a, a question to maybe uh, wrap us up on uh, putting you on the spot on that but <laughs> well, you know, um, again, tw 20 years ago, well, 25 years ago when I wrote my first long global warming article and interviewed um, Carrie Emanuel and um, Bob Buttermeyer and all these people about sea level rise, the same questions were, uh, had the same answer. It was, there was a rough sense of a three feet rise possible um, by some point in the century and we're kind of still there so I guess at that in that sense societies I guess it doesn't sound like society should stand and wait for scientists to come up with some clearer answer that we have to find a way to act in coastal regions many of which are implicitly vulnerable to coastal risks like hurricanes New York City had a terrible one in 1823 um, we just have to act more wisely in these areas, but is there anything that this is it actually could it be better for the science community to say you know we're not going to give you a clear answer anytime soon you've got to get busy now is that a better way do you think to state the case rather than and and, and all the science is really important but I just want to get the sense that society too often has this expectation well we'll learn more next year therefore so we can just wait a little longer is that is that a is that kind of a not the, the way we should be thinking societally? I, I think that's a, a great question, Andy. Um, and uh, I, I think that we have to begin to prepare. I mean, uh, it's true that there's uncertainty, and, and it's important. It's non-trivial uncertainty. You know, there's the difference between one foot and, and five or six feet is a, is a big deal. Um, but we are going to get some more sea level rise. There's no uncertainty about the sign. We we're and for going, centuries, if not millennia. And for centuries, if not millennia. The ocean continues to respond to, uh, to the atmosphere that we create for something like a thousand years. And that sea, le sea level will continue to rise over that period as well. So 
we need to prepare for sea level rise. Um, we can debate how quickly and how much, but uh, we have to start asking ourselves some tough questions about um, what areas we want to protect and what areas we need to retreat from. It's really only a matter of time. Okay. Great. Well, uh, thanks everyone for the panelists for taking part today, and thanks everyone online for, for tuning in and uh, sending in some great questions. Uh, this will be archived uh, immediately after we, we wrap up here and available uh, on the uh, NASA Explorer YouTube account. That's uh, youtube.com slash NASA Explorer. And, uh, and again, thanks a lot. Uh, we might be looking to do a number of, of other climate topics uh, in the coming months. So have a good afternoon. Thanks Great, for thank opening you. the door. Thanks, Thanks Patrick. Thanks.